Okay, good morning all. It is my great pleasure to introduce Robert Sternberg, who is speaking today as a recipient of this year's William James Fellow Award, APS's highest honor, recognizing a lifetime of significant intellectual contributions to the basic science of psychology. Bob is a pioneer in the study of human intelligence and was among the first to recognize that previous definitions of this concept were far too narrow and not necessarily predictive of success in life. He's currently a professor of human development at Cornell University. He's previously served in the faculty and administration at the University of Wyoming, Oklahoma State University, Tufts University, and Yale University. Bob transformed the study of intelligence, which historically has had a heavy focus on academic achievement with his triarchic theory, which distinguishes between analytical creative, and practical intelligence. He's used a battery of analyses, including reaction time, factor analysis, predictive analysis, and cultural examinations to develop and test this concept of successful intelligence. This new way of understanding and quantifying achievement has had ramifications not only for how we understand developmental processes related to intelligence, but also for teaching practices, university admissions policies, and how we predict leadership potential. Bob is an APS fellow and past recipient of the APS James McKean Cattell Award. He's received as many awards from international organizations, including the International Association for Cognitive Education and Psychology, the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics, and the Inter-American Society of Psychology, as he has from educational organizations, such as the National Association for Gifted Children, American Educational Research Association, and Mensa Education and Research Foundation. Today, he will be exploring the utility of standardized tests of intelligence and academic preparation, which data have shown to be poor predictors of other key aspects of achievement, such as creativity, reasoning, and ethical behavior. Please join me in welcoming Bob Sternberg. Uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you for being here at 9 o'clock on the first morning of the convention. I realize it's a pretty crummy time to come to a talk, and I especially appreciate your being here. Uh, so um, the title of today's talk, uh, as it's going to come out, is called Appointment in Samara. Uh, are we rushing to create a society of smart and not-so-smart fools? Uh, before I start, I want to thank my wife, Karen, and my five children, Seth, Sarah, Sammy, Brittany, and Melody, uh, my advisors, Endel Talvin, Gordon Bauer, and Tex Garner, all my many students over the years, and uh, the universities I've been at, Yale, Stanford, Yale again, South Oklahoma State, and Cornell. Okay, so there is a story called Appointment in Samara. Some of you may know it. But in case you don't, I'll read it. A merchant in Baghdad sends his servant to the marketplace for provisions. Soon afterward, the servant comes home, white and trembling, and tells him that in the marketplace he was jostled by a woman whom he recognized as death, and she made a threatening gesture. Borrowing the merchant's horse, he flees at great speed to Samara, where he believes death will not find him. The merchant then goes to the marketplace and finds death, and asks why she made the threatening gesture. She replies, that was not a threatening gesture. It was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. <laughs> so that uh, story is going to be sort of the theme for the talk today. Uh, and the thesis is that the invention of intelligence tests and related tests was going to be a way to create a better, longer, and more productive future for us as a society, just as was the trip to Samara. When the servant fled to Samara, he thought he was going to have a longer and better life. But as with that trip, things did not turn out as planned. The tests, the way we use them today, often reward and select the wrong people. They take us to Samara. And that's what I'm going to be elaborating on in my talk today. So let me frame the problem. And this talk is sort of a story. Uh, so uh, you have to sort of follow the storyline in order to get the punchline. During the 20th century, IQs rose roughly 30 points. 
uh, in the United States, they're still rising, though at a slower pace. So that means that IQs today are more than two standard deviations higher than they were in 1900. This is an enormous increase. Two standard deviations over a century. The difference between someone's being average and gifted or someone's being average and borderline deficient. Hard to believe, and yet it's an, Flynn's finding is irrefutable. No one has refuted it. The increases are primarily in fluid, not crystallized skills. That is, the ones that once were thought to be impervious to cultural influences. So the increases are exactly where people thought they wouldn't be. The increase in IQ indicates, as Flynn has suggested, that people today are better equipped to handle IQ-related challenges than in the past. Reflected, for example, in the more adept use of technology, quicker learning and reasoning with some kinds of abstract concepts, and greater mental speed. So the kinds of skills that IQ tests, SATs, ACTs, GREs measure, people are better at that stuff. They really are. You know, my kids are better at using cell phones than I am. They're better at using computers. They're better at using subway toll machines, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, can't, I always have to have them do that, and they're only six. <laughs> it, it's downhill for me. Uh, if one looks at contemporary problems, though, one wonders whether high IQs have been indifferent to or even adverse to solving serious world problems. And I'm going to argue why they could be adverse to that. So if you look at serious world problems like climate change, poverty and increasing disparities of income, wars and other kinds of violence, political repression, pollution, diseases, especially ones for which antibiotics are becoming increasingly ineffective, these problems are at least as severe today as they were in 1900. Most of them are much worse. Pollution is worse, climate change is worse, uh, disparity of income is worse than at any time since the Gilded Age and is now going beyond that. So the problems, despite huge ri raises in, rise in IQ, are getting worse in many ways. Two days ago, a candidate for Congress physically attacked and injured a reporter. One day ago, he won the special election after the attack. And that epitomizes, to some extent, what is happening right now in this country after universal gains of 30 points in IQ over the 20th century. Now, you may say, well, in that state, they didn't get the gain. They did. They got the gain in every state and in every country Flynn studied. So you can't say, oh, that's this northwestern state. This, these gains applied all over the world. So the people who elected him and who elected the current government are people who have IQs more than 30 points higher than in 1900. The studies of Lewis Term and Irina Sabotnik of the gifted show that high IQ does lead to higher levels of many kinds of professional success. Many people have shown that. But it's not as clear that high IQ in itself leads to out, truly outstanding top level performance. IQ leads to better outcomes for individuals, more money, more fame, bigger house, bigger cars, but it's an individual member. <clears throat> it's not clear that it leads to better outcomes for all members of society. Indeed, it may lead to greater disparities. Uh, what can happen is that the people with IQs who rise in the meritocracy through a closed system, because at each level you have to have a higher and higher IQ, or SAT score, or ACT score, or GRE score, to get to the next level. Those people get to the top, they look for more like themselves, uh, and then the disparities increase, and then they use their high IQs to persuade the people who are not benefiting that they're actually doing quite well. So those people vote for them. So the main way you raced ahead in America until the mid-1960s was through family connections. So the way you get into Harvard and Yale is because you came from the right family or the right prep school or whatever. These were thought to be predictive of who would be the leaders of tomorrow. So the idea was if you came from a so-called good family, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, the whole male, uh, then, you were on the, then you had the stuff to be successful. Uh, one was thought to be able to override weak family connections through hard work. To some extent, that was true then. Now this has become one of the least socially mobile countries <clears throat> in the Western Hemisphere. The main way to race ahead today is through performance on tests, standardized or otherwise. Most private schools, colleges, and postgraduate programs require al what I'm going to call alphabet tests, ERB, SSAT, SAT, ACT, GRE, LSAT, GMAT, MCAT, and plus school grades. 
In the early 20th century, James Conant, who was president of Harvard, and Henry Chauncey, originally of Harvard, and then president of ETS, they proposed replacing SES with standardized test scores. That seemed like a good idea. It seemed like going to Samara was a really good idea because you were going to replace family wealth and social standing with a meritocracy. By the mid-1960s, Inslee Clark at Yale and others completed what appeared to be a transition, and it all seemed good. Let's put people ahead on their merit, not just on what prep school they went to. There are two things they did not and could not have realized. They were well-intentioned. They had what seemed like a good idea, just as going to Samara seemed like a good idea. <clears throat> First, the alphabet tests are largely proxies for IQ tests. We don't call them that, but they measure G plus other educational components, as do IQ tests. They exemplify what Spearman called the indifference of the indicator. Spearman recognized in 1904 that it doesn't matter what the tests look like, they all measure the same thing, general intelligence. So whether you keep, if you keep making cosmetic changes in the test, that's good for marketing, but it makes absolutely no difference in terms of what it measures. You can make the SAT twice as long, still measuring the same thing. You can have it measure this, that, the other, it's still the same thing. Second thing they didn't realize is that test scores are highly correlated with SES socioeconomic status. The correlation isn't perfect, it's high. So that it ended up that to some extent the tests were a way of, you might call it laundering uh, social class. The alphabet tests have been promoted as a scholastic aptitude, a scholastic assessment, and it's nothing in particular tests. They measure in part abilities, but in part achievement. And the thing to remember is that all ability tests are achievement tests measuring acquired skills and knowledge. As I said before, it was once thought that abstract reasoning tests don't measure achievement, but those actually are the tests that have the largest Flynn effect, not the smallest. They're the most susceptible to schooling. So the, these tests measure achievement of earlier times. So the question is, are the obstacles in this race to get ahead in society, are they fair? And then it depends on what you mean by fair. The test disadvantaged many people with non-traditional backgrounds, but so do the criteria. So within the predictive system, the tests are predictive and show minimal bias. So the criteria have the same bias as the predictors, so everything looks fine. But when you go outside the predictive system, it's a different story. If you have kids who are raised with English not as a first language, or like our kids, they're raised bilingually, or they grow up in a house where there aren't so many books, uh, they grow up in a bicultural house, all kinds of things. They're test anxious. When you go outside the system, they don't look so fair. The focus of critics of tests has been largely, I believe, on the obstacles in the race the existence of tests that favor some groups over others. But I think there's a bigger problem that we tend to neglect, and certainly all the test prep companies and the testing companies and the whole educational establishment is running the wrong race. So it's the problem isn't so much the obstacles in the race, but rather that we're running the wrong race, we're racing towards Samara. So what's wrong? You know, a lot of people get up and bitch and whine and say, you know, oh, I'm such a victim. What is it that's wrong? You know, how can we fix it? The qualities our country and world need, most today are not fully measured by alphabet tests. So the problem is, should we use the SAT or a test optional or sorted test or that mean test or the other? It's that we're measuring a very limited selection of things. We measure G because it's easy to measure, but that's like the man who lost his keys in the dark but it looks for the keys under the street lamp because it's easier to see under the street lamp than in the dark. Measure what's easy to measure. So what should we do? What I've claimed in a book I wrote in 2016 uh, called What Universities Can Be is that we should be developing active concerned citizens and ethical leaders. Uh, the kinds of people who are gonna make a positive, meaningful, and potentially enduring difference to the world. That they're, and, and they don't have to be CEOs or presidents, they just have to make some, that the world is a better place for them having been in it. But we aren't doing that. If you look at our country's leaders today, many of them were educated at top colleges and universities. If you look at the people who ran in the primaries, you know, Harvard, Penn, Yale, but a lot of our leaders are an international travesty and historical embarrassment. So what are we doing wrong? You may disagree with that, it's just my view. Just read the paper. Okay, 
So what are we missing? What aren't we looking for? And what won't the testing companies look for? Because they're making money with what they do. And the problem isn't with the testing companies. It's with everyone. It's with the admissions offices that whine and whine and whine, but don't want to change. It's with the parents who are used to this system and are afraid to change it. With schools who keep buying this stuff from the publishers. So it's not like you can point to a finger. It's, it's a system. So what are we missing? Well, one thing is rational thinking. Keith Stanovich has showed that rational thinking shows little correlation with IQ-related measures. And deductive reasoning shows only modest to moderate relations with IQ-related measures. And the performance components of deductive reasoning are different from those of inductive reasoning tests. What does that mean? What that means is that one thing we seem to be missing a lot of in our leadership today, and in many people today, is rational thinking. Like if a guy punches a reporter out, maybe it's not the right person to elect to Congress. Uh, maybe people shouldn't be elected to Congress who, when things are going horribly, instead of trying to figure out why they're going horribly, they try to figure out what's wrong. But you know, do we want a country where party loyalty is more important than the country? So Stanovich's research shows that in everyday tasks requiring rational thinking, such as heuristics and biases problems, IQ doesn't predict success on those things. So when it comes to actually thinking rationally, think about what's on an IQ test or an SAT test. That is not what those tests measure. They do measure important skills, but one thing they don't measure is rational thinking. So you can have a high IQ and be what Keith Stanovich calls disrationalic suffer from dysrationality. My own research showed that performance on informal logic problems was only weakly related to the more formal logical problems you'd find on IQ tests. So when it comes to real world fallacies, you know, in everyday life, like the kinds of things when people deal with others, when they deal with their life, when they deal with their job, those things aren't predicted by IQ. So what else are we missing beside rational thinking? Well, we don't measure creative thinking. And creativity has never been more important because the world is changing so fast. And if you're not creative in your life and in business, it's very hard to succeed because when things change, you know, we, we all know it needs no scholars who are, you know, the, the field changes and they're still doing what they did in their dissertation, even though they're 60. Uh, now I would like to talk about my dissertation, actually. A lot of people didn't appreciate how one... No, forget it, I'm not going to do that, because you were laughing at me, so I'm not going to do it. Okay, so creative thinking involves producing ideas and products that are novel, surprising, and compelling. It's, it's not an inborn ability, it's largely an attitude toward life. So creative thinking is about, as Todd and Lubert and I have said, it's about buying low and selling high in the world of ideas. We all know that we should buy low and sell high, but almost no one does that. And there are studies that have showed that. You know, like if you have, look at investment companies, chance does better than four out of five investment fund managers, which is why more and more people are, are sticking with just unmanaged funds. So creative thinking is about producing ideas that are novel, surprising, and compelling, that'll move the world forward. And which of our standardized tests is measuring it? None. And there are tests to measure it, like the Torrance, but the way they measure it is like, what are some unusual uses of a paperclip? And this is not the kind of creativity I'm talking about. I'm talking about creativity in your life and in your job, not whether you can think of a new way to use a paperclip. So who are the people who are creative? They're people who are willing to defy the crowd. You know, one of the things that was great about my advisors, Endel Telving especially, Gordon Bauer, Garner, is that they were willing to defy the crowd. Uh, as I said last night, uh, one of the things I learned from Endel Telving is that everyone believes something is probably wrong. But that's not the way science works. And it's not the way the world works. Everybody likes creativity as long as the new ideas don't impinge on them. And if it impinges on them, then they don't like it so much. So, and be, so being creative is hard because when you defy the crowd, it gets other people uncomfortable. If you don't do anything that bothers them, it's fine, but if it bothers them, it gets them nervous. So you need to be able to defy the crowd and willing to defy the crowd. So many people have so-called creative intelligence, but they're not creative because they don't want to stand out. They don't want to make enemies. But being creative isn't just about defying the crowd. It's not just about when everyone tells you this, you're willing to do that. It's not just when you know, journals say, well, why don't you do work in a more conventional area? I mean, 
I remember when I was coming up for tenure, and I heard that this was at Yale, and I heard that a lot of the letters were saying, well, you know, good guy, but he's working in the field of intelligence, which is a really crummy field. I mean, why not get someone in a you know, nice, solid field like memory or learning? Or uh, so science is no different. You know, if you're working in a sort of off area, it makes people uncomfortable. But it's not just defying the crowd, it's also defying yourself. And defying yourself means that you're not going to talk about your dissertation when you're 60. The hardest thing to do, it's even harder than defying the crowd, is saying, you know, I believe that for a while, but it's time for me to move on. It's time to go to the next step. It's time for me to broaden my thinking or to move in a different direction. Uh, I have another talk that I sometimes give about my career, and I've said that uh, a lot of growing up in a career is realizing that what you did earlier is, maybe it's wrong, or maybe it's just a special case, but it's growing with age. And some people get stuck on a problem, and they just keep working on it, they keep working on they, it. They, they can't defy themselves because they get so invested in the way they think and what they do. Uh, that they never move forward. And if you, have, you see a professor, an advisor, whatever, who's pretty sure that his ideas are right, or her ideas are right, you're in trouble. Because once a person is sure their ideas are right, they'll never move on. They're stuck. And the third thing is defying the zeitgeist. Uh, and that means that what everybody else assumes, you challenge. And you're willing to say, look, just because we've assumed something for so long doesn't mean it must be true. So people with the creative attitude, and this was what we try to instill in our kids and what I've tried to instill in my students, it's not just about this ability. It's a willingness to redefine problems, that if you have a problem a certain way and you can't solve it, and you can't solve it, and you can't solve it, you ask, is there some way to sell it? A willingness to sell your ideas, to persuade other people. Because one of the things you learn in psychological science is that the more creative an idea, the harder it is to get into a journal or to get funded. I mean, when you start, you don't think that. But then you begin to realize, because the reviewing process, process often homogenizes things uh, so that it becomes more and more prototypical. One of the things I've said about my own journal, Perspectives on Psychological Science, is when I have a paper submitted to me, I actually like to get a negative review or two, as long as there are other reviews that are really positive. Because what happens with a lot of journals is that papers get in just because there's nothing particularly wrong with them. And what that means is that if you have a creative idea, people probably won't accept it, and you have to be willing to sell it. Willingness to recognize the limits of expertise, uh, which means that if you're a professor, you realize that the longer you've been in the field, the more likely you are to get entrenched. Uh, and you're really lucky to have students who know less and will recognize your entrenchment. As I said last night, a lot of my best work has been with students where they led projects because I get entrenched, they sure don't. A willingness to overcome obstacles, because if you're creative, there are always obstacles, and you have to be willing to overcome them. Willingness to take sensible risks and courage. And what that means is if you, want, you, know, if you look at the people who are really sort of the top scientists, uh, I once edited a book called uh, Psychologists Defying the Crowd. And I think they're almost all, without exception, people who are willing to go their own way. They didn't just you know, get another prestigious article, another prestigious article, another journal of high impact, but they're willing to go their own way and fight for it, even though it meant that they would be rejected more, that have more grant proposals rejected, more articles rejected, and more people not liking what they do. Uh, and in my own field of intelligence, it's like, you know, this G thing, an idea that came up in 1904, has persisted and persisted and persisted, and it keeps going because people don't want to defy the crowd and they don't want to defy themselves. And most people who go into intelligence are people who did well on tests. Uh, I, I, of course, I did poorly on tests, so here I am. Okay, so there are different kinds of creativity, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but the main point I want to make is this. The kind of creativity as a society that, what we, that we reward most is advanced forward incrementation. What journals and grant agencies love is here's a step, 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 and you're the next step. And that's great creativity for journals and granting agencies because you don't threaten anybody. You don't make anyone uncomfortable, you don't make them nervous, you don't make them feel bad about themselves. And that's the kind of work that's mostly published in our most prestigious journals because 
the reviewers are not upset that they're going to look stupid if the article is published. But the kinds of creativity that really changed science and changed the world are things like redefining problems, redirecting a field that's going this way and you try to get it to go that way, uh, redirecting in a backward way, reinitiating, starting a whole new field, synthesizing, and to the extent that alphabet tests predict any of this at all, they predict the sort of small forward incremental steps. And so if we ask, well, you know, it seems like we have a lot of creativity in our society, you know, what's this problem with Samara? Often it's the kind of creativity that just keeps us running the wrong race. And if we're in the wrong race, moving a little faster in that race will get us closer to an end, but it may be an end like Samara. So we have assessed creativity in a number of ways. Uh, we've done conceptual projection tasks where you kind of, you're given problems like imagine an object is GRU, meaning green until the year 3000 and blue thereafter, or BLEEN, meaning blue until the year 3000 and green thereafter, and you have to do reasoning with concepts like that. And we've used creative short stories where we give people either title, a bunch of titles or a bunch of pictures and ask them to write or tell a short story. We've had people design scientific experiments. We've had them create advertisements for new products. We've had them come up with counterfactual future histories, like suppose that Rosa Parks had given up her seat on the bus, what would the world be like today? Or suppose the Nazis had won World War II, what would the world be like today? We've had them caption cartoons. But we try to get away from the unusual uses of a paperclip to things that will be more exciting and relevant to people's lives. <coughs> The alphabet tests don't claim to measure creative thinking, and they don't. It, so th that's a problem, because IQ, which is more or less what they measure, is a necessary but not sufficient for creative thinking. Because creativity requires people not only to generate novel, surprising, and compelling ideas, but to evaluate them. So the IQ part is evaluating the ideas. You can't just generate the ideas. You have to ask if they're good. So that's that the tests measure. What it doesn't do, what the tests don't do, is find the people who are going to be the real creators, who are going to make the real difference. And part of making the world a better place and a different place is this creativity. So what we showed in our Rainbow Project, which is what a uh, project I did with my last years at Yale, and it was a national project, is the test of creative thinking could double prediction nationwide a freshman year GPA over SAT and ACT. Our Kaleidoscope and Panorama project showed the tests of creative thinking predicted quality of extracurricular performance, whereas ACT, SAT did not. We doubled prediction of freshman GPA and increased prediction of extracurricular success, and we reduced ethnic group differences relative to alphabet tests. So we got great results, and it seemed like, wow, these can make a difference. And you know, when you do something that's sort of a redirection, I got exactly the reward I deserved. You know, it was so great that my creativity was recognized, my funding was cut off. So at that point, uh, foolishly, I didn't see that coming, uh, that's when I went into academic administration. <laughs> Seriously, because I realized as a professor, nobody's friggin' going to listen to me. I mean, if I get results like that, I really thought a testing company is going to keep funding us. So I went into administration. In large part, my goal was to put these ideas into practice. And in my years at Tufts and at Oklahoma State is when we did Kaleidoscope and Panorama. And even though the testing company, the fund of us said, you can't upscale this. Tens of thousands of kids now have been in kaleidoscope and panorama. And we're selecting kids for admission who before never would have gotten in. Kids who are creative, kids who are practically common sense oriented, kids with wisdom related characteristics, the kinds of things you need to make a positive, meaningful, and enduring difference to the world, and exactly the kinds of things that are not being measured by our current tests. So another quality you need is common sense. Uh, common sense is really important to life. And you sure don't see much of it in Washington these days. It's almost like to get elected, you have to have a negative score on a common sense test. Uh, you know, it, it would be funny if it weren't so damn serious. Uh, practical intelligence is based in large part on tacit knowledge, 
which is informal procedural knowledge you need in order to be able to adapt successfully to an environment. And it's typically not explicitly taught, and it's not even verbalized. So it's the kind of stuff when you go to a new graduate school or a new job, or you're in a new romantic relationship, or you just had kids. It's the kind of stuff you figure out about dealing with the new people or the new environment. It's not, the it's not the stuff that is in the university handbook. It's the stuff that's not in the university handbook that gets you the bigger office or gets you the raise or gets you grant proposals accepted and so on. So examples in academia would be exactly that. More office space, articles accepted, grant proposals funded. Uh, so we measure this kind of common sense practical thinking by situational judgment tests that present problems from one's own world of work. So, or we might use essay questions, such as how would you persuade a friend of an idea of yours that the friend did not initially accept? We've also used video problems presenting unsolved everyday life problems that test takers then have to solve for the individuals in the videos, where the problems actually come from the people of the kind we're testing. So we don't create the problems, they create the problems, and then we do the videos. And our research has shown that IQ, which includes SAT and ACT and so on, and practical intelligence or common sense are only minimally correlated, which is how you can get all these people who went to these great universities who then run in primaries and then get elected and prove to be totally lacking in common sense. You can have high IQ and low practical intelligence or vice versa, and honestly, we see this in academia too. Academia tends to attract people with high IQ, but there isn't as much of a filter for common sense. <laughs> when, I was, uh, when I got tenure at Yale, I was telling uh, Wendell Garner, uh, my sort of senior advi faculty advisor there, about my work in practical intelligence. They looked at me and said, you know, Bob, you got tenure here not because of your practical intelligence, but despite it. <laughs> so uh, I guess that applies to me too. Uh, we also find that practical intelligence increases not exactly as a function of experience, but of how much you learn from experience. It's not that you had a lot of experience that matters, it's what you learn from it. And in a study at the University of Michigan Business School, we found that practical intelligence predicted business school project work, whereas GMAT did not. Uh, various measures of tasks and knowledge tend to be correlated within a domain. So as an academic, say, managing yourself, managing others, managing tasks, uh, they tend to be correlated, some across domains, but they're not correlated across widely diverse domains like interpersonal relations, working in a shop, and doing one's taxes. So within a small domain, they're correlated, and then as you move away, the correlation disappears. So I've talked about rational thinking, creativity, common sense, and now I'm going to talk about what I think is the most important characteristic, and that is wisdom. What's wisdom? Wisdom is the use of knowledge and skills toward a common good. So it's not just being smart, it's using your smartness and your knowledge for a common good by balancing your own interests with other people's interests and higher order and just larger interests over the long as well as the short term through the infusion of positive ethical values. Again, nothing that our tests measure, and yet so important if you want to select and develop people who are going to make a positive, meaningful, and potentially enduring difference to the world at some level. Wisdom is probably the most important thing, and we don't measure it. So how might you measure wisdom? Well, we, do, we have done that in our tests at uh, Tufts and at Oklahoma State. Uh, for example, describe how you might make a positive, meaningful, and possibly enduring difference to the world at some point in your life, you know, like when you grow up. Or two nations are arguing over water supplies from a river they share in common. The upstream country is taking more water than the downstream company can, believes is fair. How would you deal with the problem? Uh, you just observed your roommate copy text directly from the internet to his paper without attribution and so on. What do you do? And those are the kinds of problems we used to measure these constructs. We have a version for future doctors uh, as well. You made a mistake in uh, treating a patient. Uh, the patient will never find out about the mistake. There's no way anyone will find out, but it did have a significant effect on the outcome. What do you do? Those kinds of things. If one looks at failed leaders at any level, they could be leaders in a field, they could be leaders of a state, a nation, 
They rarely failed merely because of low IQ, but rather because of lack of wisdom and ethics. If you pick your top failed leader in the world today, the one thing you can be assured of is it's someone who's not wise. And what's sad is it's so hard to think of people who are wise or in leadership positions. If one looks at how leaders got to where they are, it is often because they were elected or appointed by people who themselves, whatever their IQs, put the leaders into place. So why does this, I've talked about, you know, why does this matter to the world? It matters to the world because climate change, increasing income disparities, pollution, all the things I talked about at the beginning, and we're selecting people for IQ. And some of those people are great lobbyists for polluters. I remember talking to one of my Yale uh, classmates, and he said he was in uh, environmental law, and I said, Rich, that's really great. I mean, you know, I wish I were doing something good for the world. He said, you don't understand, I work for the polluters. Uh, and, you know, and my daughter, Sarah, uh, I mentioned I have five kids, uh, Sarah's a law professor at Duke, but she started off as a lawyer and she quit because she was always representing the wrong side. So, but it adds to our field too. Graduate programs put fairly heavy, although certainly not exclusive emphasis on college grades and GRE scores. Neither measures much of the kinds of skills discussed here. You know, they, they measure the analytical part, that's it. So are we then admitting the people will be the greatest scientists? <clears throat> Wendy Williams and I found at Yale that the GRE was a moderate predictor of first year grades in graduate psychology, but that was it. Something about first year grades, then it's pretty much over. And we had as criteria first year grades, but also professors' ratings of analytical, creative, and practical skills, plus ratings of the PhD dissertation. Didn't really predict much of anything. Some prediction of first year grades. More recently, uh, Karen, my wife, and I did a study and we thought, well, you know, let's try a graduate measure that measures what scientists really do. Hypothesis generation, evaluating hypotheses, evaluating experiments, being a reviewer, being an editor. So the tasks we gave students, this is at Cornell, were actually tasks that scientists and psychological science do. We found that the tests were correlated with each other and we thought, well, we'll probably get a small correlation with the SAT and the ACT. We did. Uh, it was a small negative correlation. In two out of three studies, we got a negative correlation. One study, we got zero correlations. So whatever it is that these tests test for, it's, they're not measuring the things you really need. And that's how that, my earliest triarchic theory was really based on that. I, you know, I, I sort of learned that when I was young. When I first formulated the triarchic theory, I talked about Alice, Barbara, and Celia. And Alice was a student who did really well on tests and had really super grades and great letters of recommendation. We accepted her. And she was really great her first year and got sky high test scores and always raised her hand in class. But she, she ended up near the bottom of the program because she never had any creative ideas. She was really a good GRE taker, but she's not the kind of person who's going to become a great scientist. And I contrasted her with Barbara, who didn't test that great. Uh, but was really creative. And what we found is about that. Years later, when we did an empirical study, that a test that really measures what you do in science didn't correlate with these test scores and even showed some negative correlations. This is not to say that GRE scores are irrelevant to success in science. I'm not saying that. They measure abstract analytical components of success. You do need those abstract analytical reasoning skills but they don't measure the other skills discussed here. And what we're studying now is taste in problems. Because if you look at psych psychological scientists who become really great, it's not just that they're good editors or good at generating hypotheses or uh, critiquing hypotheses, is that they study good problems. And that's what we're interested in now, looking at good, important problems. The risk of our present schemes is that we may select and then train individuals whose abstract analytical skills are good, but who are not necessarily strong either in scientific reasoning or with respect to their taste and problems. Their strength may be as a critic of others' work rather than as creators of their own work, and then they go on, you know, when they blog or they go on social media, and they have lots of bad things to say about other people but often these are people who don't have so much positive to say themselves. And as I said, what I learned from Tex Garner is that you're judged by the positive contribution you make. Why does it matter to the world? 
Gene Lippman Bloom has written what I consider a wonderful book, a book on toxic leaders. Uh, and she found certain characteristics of toxic leaders. I, I'm sure you won't recognize these in any of the leaders in the world today. They feed their followers illusions. They impair their followers' abilities to act independently. They manipulate followers' deepest needs and fears. They deceive and deliberately misdiagnose problems. Uh, they undermine institutions, norms, rules, processes. They build totalitarian regimes. They set constituents against one another, train followers to scapegoat, shun and hate, mistreat the weakest, and be still more powerful on the more powerful. And you know what? To do these things, you have to be pretty damn smart. You have to have a fairly high IQ. Or if you don't, you need people on your staff who are good at this stuff. So you can have a high IQ. The pro it's not that high IQ is bad, but if it's not moderated and somehow modulated by creativity, rational thinking, common sense, and wisdom, it can be a real problem because it can be used for bad ends. Uh, they utilize scarce resources for personal gain. They ignore the plight of their followers. You know, thanks for your vote, now screw you. They disagree or support incompetence, cronyism, and corruption, and they act with incompetence that injures their followers and the organizations for which they're responsible. You've got to recognize this stuff in some of our leaders. And this is, this is, what, this is the race to Samara. This is the race down, and we're choosing people to help run that race faster. Uh, Barbara Kellerman has talked about types of bad leaders, incompetent, rigid, intemperate, callous, corrupt, insular, and evil. Again, I don't have that much time to go into it, but again, these are smart people. Most of these people would do really well in our educational system. They go to great schools, and they learn how to advance their own interests. Countries around the world, and even close by, maybe even in North America, uh, have continued elected, if elected, and continue to elect leaders that show all these traits of narcissistic leadership, every single one of them. Uh, and they show them even before the leaders are elected. I mean, it's one thing if they're elected and ha, 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 but they even show it when they're running. Uh, these leaders lay waste to their countries and the people in them yet gather support despite their gross incompetence, disdain for their followers, lying, destructive behavior, and corruption. That's after a 30-point increase in IQ in every country Flynn studied. So what exactly has IQ bought us? We have one group, which is the group we ought to be nourishing and nurturing, which is people who are smart and wise. But we also have people who are smart and foolish, and we have people who are stupid and foolish. So you don't have people who are stupid and wise. That sounds empty. So smart and wise, smart and foolish, stupid and foolish. Smart, wise people, those are the ones who should be the leaders of our country, our states, our scientific communities, our educational institutions. How many of them do you know? And, and what are we doing to develop such leaders? So that's kind of what my book on what universities can be is about. I'm not trying to sell the book, I believe me. Uh, there will be someone outside in a uniform that will be selling <laughs> copies at the end of this. Uh, they're specially discounted. They're a dollar at Barnes & Noble. You can get them for five cents here for the remainder copies. The covers will have an X, a black X on them, so you can't resell them for three cents. No, I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> All right, so smart, wise people are the people we want to be leading us, but a lot of people with high IQs are especially susceptible to foolishness because they think they're not. So the risk of being high in SAT, ACT, and all that is you think, I'm too smart to be a fool, and that's what makes you susceptible to be a fool because there really isn't much correlation between wisdom and intelligence. And they become unrealistically optimistic. If it's my idea, it must be a good idea. And if you don't agree, then you're just stupid or you're evil or you're trying to bring me down. They're egocentric. It's all about them. They are falsely omniscient. They think they know everything. They're falsely omnipotent. They think they can do whatever they want. They're falsely invulnerable. They think they can get away with anything, and they're ethically disengaged. Uh, they think ethics are important for other people, but not them. And then when they're challenged for their ethics, they try to cover it up, and then they're elected uh, to high offices um, in other countries, of course. Uh, so smart fools, many of these people figure out ways to maximize their own gains in the face of bad leaders. Uh, but they do little to change the system. They lack the courage, the character, and the determination to make a difference to the common good. 
stupid fools. These are people with low IQs and low wisdom. There are lots of those. Uh, they're the followers of the smart fools. Uh, they're easily manipulated. They're susceptible to authoritarian leaders. They often vote against their own interests, and they're susceptible to hate and prejudice. Oh, please. Hey, that guy punched out the reporter. I'm going to vote for him. Hey, that guy encouraged his followers to attack the people who disagree with him. I'm going to vote for him. So the stupid fools are the ones with a lot of aggression, a lot of pent up, you know, why am I not getting the gravy that I deserve? Uh, and these people take advantage of it and get elected or chosen. Uh, and then there are susceptible followers of bad leaders. Uh, this is work by Thorogood and his colleagues. Uh, there, and these are the kinds of people who let the Hitlers and the Mussolinis and the get into power. Uh, they're the lost souls who just don't know what's going on. They're the authoritarians who, you know, I like a strong, powerful leader like Maduro. He's really good for the country. Uh, they're the bystanders who just let it all happen and try to keep their heads low. They're the opportunists who try to take advantage. A lot of the people who support these awful leaders are very smart, and they just look at it as a chance to make more money or to get more power or a bigger house or whatever. And then they're the smart fools, the acolytes. So what I'm saying society needs is smart, wise people. And we put a lot of emphasis on the narrow smart and none on the wise. We're not selecting or developing smart, wise people, only smart and some not so smart ones. This practice is easy, you know, just give them an IQ test or an SAT or an ACT. It's like racing to Samari just a little bit faster. Uh, we're running the wrong race. And I hope it's not too late to turn around, is it? So what are you gonna do about it? Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions, if anyone has any questions or comments or disagreements or agreements. Anybody? Yeah, uh, there's a microphone here. Hi, so as you know, we're in the middle of a replication crisis in psychology and uh, do, you, do you think it might not be hugely constructive to say the G factor was discovered in 1904 and people only use it because you know, they're kind of stuck in their ways, when actually it's one of the most replicable findings in the entire history of the discipline. And so it seems a bit strange. And if you'll allow me a second question, I don't think you contradicted yourself a little bit when you said that the critical thinking tests on one slide had a moderate relation with IQ, and then on the next slide you said IQ tests don't measure critical thinking. Of course, if you look in the most recent Keith Stanovich book, IQ tests have about a 0.7 correlation with the critical thinking uh, tests. So mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like they're measuring different things at all. Yeah. Uh, first of all, with regard to G, what, I've said, what I thought I said in the talk and what I've said in my books and articles is G is moderately predictive of a lot of things. So I'm not like some of the theorists, maybe more like Howard Gardner, who think G is useless. That said, G doesn't measure creativity. It doesn't claim to. It doesn't measure common sense. It doesn't measure wisdom. And I think if you wanted to measure rational thinking, you would be better off measuring rational thinking. Uh, the reason I think it's a problem is because if you look, as I said from the beginning, our society has been, and around the world has been going up in IQ, and it has helped us technologically. We have better cell phones, we have better computers, we have better DVD players. Uh, kids are more adept at using these things. But I don't think we have wiser people. Uh, we also have better bombs, and we seem not to be using our uh, G so well in selecting our leaders. So it's not to dump on G, it's to say that there are other things that matter. And since, you know, our measures of G are not much different than they were in 1904, we have good measures of that. So maybe we should be devoting more attention to trying to measure the other things that really matter for success. Yeah. Thank you for a very thought-provoking talk. Um, <clears throat> so, but, so you're looking at how do we select the right people, and, but one of the issues that, that I see is that we now have such wide access to education and the difference between, say, Harvard 
and UMass Boston in income disparity is actually not that big. It's smaller than the income disparity between people who have any college education and a high school education. <clears throat> so I think we have wide access to education and resources for you know, anybody with a moderate IQ. Um, or, and we can develop all of the properties that you're uh, talking about. The, qu the question really is, how do we then incentivize, once they leave these institutions, how do we incentivize as a society the right types of behaviors that will help us develop in ways and not go to Samara? Mm -hmm. And so there was a time in this country when the top marginal tax rate was 90%. And now we have people trying to lower that and to go into fields where they can take advantage of carried interest and so on instead. How do you look at the incentive side of this, and how does that sort of top-down aspect uh, interact with this bottom-up selection processes that yeah. we're talking about? Uh, well, there are a few things in what you said. The first thing is I agree that we should more incentivize after kids leave college making a positive, meaningful, and potentially enduring difference to society. That I agree. I think we should start incentivizing it not only after college, but in college and place more emphasis on, in our courses and in our extracurriculars on how are you going to use all this knowledge to make the world a better place. I don't think it should be, well, college is to learn a bunch of stuff, and then after you get out of college, these things become important. Uh, in terms of access to college education, uh, I, I would see it a little bit differently. Uh, first of all, given the rate at which college expenses have been rising, and the smaller rate at which scholarship aid has been increasing, I think a lot of kids can't go to the colleges that they would want to go to, especially if they're middle class. Uh, if you're from a very low-income family, you can get a scholarship that may be enough to go. If you're from a high-income family, you're OK. But much of the middle class is squeezed out by the current system. Uh, and I saw this even at Oklahoma State, where the tuition was much lower than at prestigious colleges, say, in the East, and a lot of people couldn't even afford to go to Oklahoma State. So I think a lot of those people, or if they do go, they end up with huge student loans that they have to pay, or they have to work 24 hours a week in order to afford to go to college, and then they graduate if they graduate at all, which many of them don't, in six, seven years or more. So I think it's not quite as rosy as perhaps you do. Uh, the last thing I would say is I think part of the issue is how we train kids uh, through, through high school. Uh, and that is, if we're using tests like the SAT and the ACT for admission, you know, I said, my kids are in friggin' kindergarten. The triplets are in kindergarten. And, you know, what I used to learn is how to play with other kids and how to be creative and things like that. That's all gone. Now it's reading and writing. There's such an emphasis on gaining these knowledge based skills. And I think knowledge based skills are important. But because of the standardized tests, I think a lot of the character building, the wisdom building, the team building has been driven out of the curriculum because the tests drive the curriculum, and that's not what the curriculum is doing. And then when you actually choose the kids, you're choosing them for skills that are only, a, it's, as I keep saying, and I, you know, people don't hear it. I'm not saying that ACTs and ICQs and SATs are not important. It's that there's so much more. And if you look at people who really make a difference to the world, you don't even have to ask what their IQ is. And if you have a leader who brags about having an IQ, you know that that's, there's something else missing that you sure wish was there. I, I'm not referring to anyone in particular. Thanks for your question. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Do we? No, we don't have time for one or two more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe after we're outside. Thank you.